Hello, my name is John Sunman. I'm the author of literary philosophical cyber nano biopunk novels, including Bio Digital, Cheap Complex Devices, The Pains, and Acts of the Apostles. If you want to know more about my books, please check out my website, johnsunman.com, or my Amazon page. Sign up for my newsletter and get a copy of BioDigital for free. Okay, enough about me. Let's talk about Tom Knight. Tom Knight, a longtime professor of computer science at MIT, brilliant fellow from the Artificial Intelligence Lab, switched his interests to biology by contemplating how to take engineering ideas and apply them to the construction of biological-based systems. Tom is the founder, one of the founders of Ginkgo Bioworks, which is one of the largest DNA, synthetic DNA companies in the world, based in Boston, Massachusetts. He's also been called the godfather of synthetic biology, not only because of his ideas on how to do biological engineering, and not only because of his work at Ginkgo Bioworks, but also because he is the instigator, founder, and um, moral force for a long time behind iGEM, International Gen Genetically Engineered Machines Competition and uh, Movement. And uh, iGEM's been going on for, I don't know, 15, 20 years now. It's a, it's a series of, uh, of competitions, biological, kind of like science fair type competitions for very extremely smart university undergraduates. It's now moved into even high schools and it is a training ground for the molecular biologists of the future. People are doing astonishing work as undergrads. Things that would have got them a PhD not too long ago are now being done over a short winter study project periods in universities all over the world. I spoke with uh, Tom Knight. I first went to meet him. He's a friend of a friend. I went to meet him when Ginkgo Bioworks was uh, operating in a tiny little building in Boston with a bunch of used machines they had bought on eBay. That was in 2008. I went back to see him in the spring of 2017, and my goodness, what a difference. They're now in their new headquarters, uh, which are magnificent, and uh, overlooking the harbor in Boston. And I spent uh, more than an hour talking with Tom about the past, present, and future of genetic engineering. I uh, hope you'll enjoy our conversation. Please leave comments below. And as I said, if you sign up for my Technopotheosis newsletter, you can, uh, you will get a copy of my novel, BioDigital, in the ebook format of your choice. As our friend Omar Isof, the great uh, weightlifting YouTube authority says, if you like the damn video, like the damn video below, just press the like button. I'd appreciate it, and why not subscribe to the channel? There'll be lots of more uh, interesting interviews and conversations with all kinds of smart, interesting people. Thanks. I'm just going to give you a couple of, of, of <coughs> things that I that interest me. Okay. And then you can just talk. All right. Pick out whatever whatever uh, parts that you, you feel are you have something to say on. So I went to a talk at the Broad Institute by one of your people here. I don't remember his name. I'm sorry, but it was a lovely talk. Very uh, candid. Talk. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was a great talk. Um, and he was uh, talking about the uh, perfumer uh, client that you had and how you were designing organisms that could produce exquisitely tailored uh, uh, scent or ingredients to make scents and fragrances. And at one point he showed a photo taken in Armenia or someplace. It was a warehouse of people with giant, and, and the sun was coming through, right. and people were tossing the <laughs> rose petals. Picture, right? yes. You know that picture? So I was <coughs> there in the, in the auditorium thinking, well, there goes their jobs, and there goes their way of life, and there goes all their traditions, and so forth. And uh, I mean, if I were the client, I would still go to you guys and buy it, because it's so much cheaper, presumably. But but the implications of, of these of these technologies are kind of vast and far-reaching. Anyway, so that's yes, that's, right. That's right. So where do you want to start? Wherever you want to start, <laughs> any of those themes. Wow. I, I don't. I don't have a, a 
you know, a checklist of questions I want to answer. I just want to get your, you know, your thoughts on these kinds of things. Wow. Well, we could start, I guess, with the last one, which is, you know, the, the rose petal uh, industry. What we can do is we can, <clears throat> we can make the fragrances of the roses, uh, you know, accessible to a great many more people. So we can we can uh, you know make them cheaper. We can make them more uh, you know more readily available. We can make them uh, with uh, you know in higher volumes and more repeatably and more um, in, probably in a more environmentally friendly way as yeah. well. Uh, that doesn't mean that there won't always, I think probably always, be a, a demand for the uh, you know, high-end natural product that people have been used to. So I'm not too concerned about you know, losing that as a technology. Uh, there may be fewer people involved in that, uh, but I don't think your your basic French perfumer is not going to go right. to a yeast vat to pick pick up the uh, the cheap fragrance. Right. They're going to go to the fields in southern France that they have always gone to to. You know, pick, well, still, even in, in this flowers. country, uh, is it not? I mean, on the horizon, that uh, synthetic meat will be as good as for a lot of uses as as uh, animal. Product meat. Well, yes, you, yeah. you you see you see very mixed reactions to that, right? Yeah. You know, you 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 see people uh, like Peta uh, yeah. that you know are looking at that and saying, you know, what should I think about this? On the one hand, I'm avoiding killing animals. On the other hand, it's this engineered stuff, and <laughs> maybe it's a GMO, and yeah. maybe it's a. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know I think there's a sort of a cognitive dissonance that yeah. occurs there. <laughs> right. You know what are, what are, what is my what are my ethics supposed to tell me right. that I'm supposed to think about this? Right. Uh, you know and you know even though uh, you know it, it it seems pretty clear there's going to be a demand for it and certainly environmentally I mean there's just a huge benefit to yeah. moving away from animal uh, protein to plant-derived or, or microbe-derived protein. Absolutely. So the, I'm just thinking, I mean, I would eat it if it tastes like as good as meat. I don't eat much meat myself, right. but but if for a bunch of reasons, I just don't want to be part of the meat methane economy. Sure, absolutely. You know? And uh, I don't, want to, <clears throat> don't, don't really, I do think about the killing of animals. It kind of, it doesn't stop me completely from eating meat, but it's always there nagging. Sure. So if there were a, a hamburger that were like, not putting methane into the environment and not well, killing a cow. I, well, there I are. Need it. <clears throat> there are. I mean, yeah. there's this company, Impossible Foods. And, yeah. and they, they are. I think you can, you can't find them routinely. I don't think, but there are. They'll be here in five there, years. Or there whatever, are places. Though. I believe in New York and in San Francisco, there are restaurants that serve it at least occasionally. Yeah. So, what do you think the the major implications of synthetic biology are going to be? It, for the next five years, and then look out 15 years. <laughs> well, so I, I have a general rule of thumb that, you know, it's uh, on the five-year horizon, you always uh, overestimate what's going to happen. Yeah. And in the 10-year horizon, you always underestimate what's right. going to happen. Um, so, you know, with that as a proviso, I would say, uh, Probably in five years, you know, we will we will be doing many of the things that we're doing right now. We'll probably be doing them better. Uh, we will be making lots of flavors and fragrances. We will be um, <clears throat> we'll be using biology in ways that probably we haven't thought of yet. You know, making things like plastics out of them. Uh, we already see uh, bolt threads and uh, spiber making you know, textiles yep. uh, with synthetic biology. Uh, I, I think all of those things will progress and progress, I suspect, on the five-year time schedule in 
relatively predictable ways. Right. I don't think there's going to be there's not going to be a game changer that's going to happen on that time frame. In ten years, I think you know we have uh, I suspect a very different situation. Um, in ten years, we have. Um, all of a sudden, now it, it's likely, I think, that we're going to be able to start engineering some more complex organisms, not just microbes. Right. Um, although I think the complexity of, of you know, most of the eukaryotic world is way, way worse than most people think. Right. You know, uh, I think that's, if I had to say one thing that people don't really understand about genetics, it's uh, you know the huge disparity between the complexity of uh, bacteria or yeast versus the complexity of a human. Right. And uh, you know that's a there's you know it's if you just look at the size of the DNA, it's a factor of a thousand. But it's much worse than that. Right. All well, the epigenetic. Uh, it's stuff. epigenetic. It's uh, multicellular. Uh, there's development. Um, there's many more. Uh, even within a single cell, there's many more compartments within the cell. There's you know levels of complexity that I think we haven't even gotten to yet. Yeah. Uh, and that leaves aside, of course, the uh, nervous system, mm -hmm. which is you know. Uh, just a whole other level of, of complexity in, in the, uh, in the you know, human uh, genome. So uh, I think that that's, uh, I don't think even in 10 years we're going to be close to a level of understanding that lets us uh, do anything significant. So my, my scary novel isn't quite happening yet. Yeah, I guess not. Well, some, some parts of it are happening. Yeah, you know, some that. parts. Yeah. So. I think in the 10-year time horizon, and maybe before that, I hope before that, uh, we're going to get to a place where we understand how cells, how at least the simple cells work much more uh, thoroughly than we do right now. Uh, that's another thing which I think most, most of the community, uh, certainly the public, doesn't really fully appreciate, which is that I think this is partly also true of the scientific community. There's this assumption, I think, that you know, well, uh, we've studied biology and you know we've conquered the understanding of all of these bacteria, and we fully understand everything that's going on in a bacterium. And now we have moved on, and we've sequenced people, and it's next. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm here to tell you <laughs> that <laughs> that's so. completely wrong. Yeah. <laughs> there, uh, there is a level of complexity inside bacteria, even the very simplest ones, that we don't understand and that we have no good models for. And it, you know, it is a level of hubris that says, you know, we are, you know, we now are able to. Uh, completely capture the understanding of those simple organisms and, uh, and, and are able to thoroughly engineer them. And, you know, that's a, I think that's a, a, a way of, uh, of, of sort of fooling ourselves. Uh, the scientific community has, um, it's, it's da dangerous, dangerous uh, generalizations, but I, I'll make it anyway. All right. In, I would say, in general, the scientific community uh, has reached the conclusion that they've learned everything about biology which they can successfully apply to people from bacteria, and therefore it's time to move on. Right. Um, if your job is to engineer bacteria, yeah. if your job is to make changes to it and do things and uh, and and make a profit even from yeah. doing those things, which is my goal right at the moment. Um, it's an entirely different matter because you know there's a level of understanding which is totally, totally missing. Yeah. Uh,
just to put some facts on the ground, just so that we're you know you you know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, Craig Venter and and the JCVI uh, took one of the very very simplest bacteria and uh, the mycoplasmas, and they simplified that by you know recoding uh, and rebuilding the genome. They built a version of the genome which was stripped of many of the in, you know genes that that in lab conditions and that's an important right. caveat that in lab conditions were not necessary at the end of that process they had a an organism with on the order of 500 genes 450 i've forgotten yeah. the exact number um, but the important point the point i wanted to make is that although we know what about 70% of those genes are and what they do, or rather I should be more careful, what one of the things that those genes right. do, right. <laughs> yeah. we, uh, there's another 30% of the genes that are essential for that organism to survive. It won't survive without them. Won't survive without them, but we have no clue scientifically about what they do. Right. So, uh, as an engineer, that frightens me. Yeah. Right. I'm supposed to go and I'm supposed to make rational changes to this organism, and uh, and you know there's big gaping holes in my understanding of how it works right. and what's necessary and what's not. Okay. Well, let's let's take that you said that keyword frightens you, and let's go a little bit into this subject of biosafety, biosecurity. And oh. if there's anything there, and this because I'm a novelist, you know, of course, I write stories about no, this kind of no, stuff. I and that, I, and I, went to, I went to a DEF CON last year oh, where dear. where there is a, um, uh, have you ever been to DEF CON, by the way? No. Yeah, it's it's a trip, man. I've been I, twice. Yeah, um, I can imagine and, that it and, might be. And, uh, yeah, it's freaky deaky. And people are walking around, because you know, they're so, um, you go to DEF CON, you pay cash. Right? Yeah. So if the FBI says, where's your attendee list, they say there is none. Right? They don't take your name, you give right. them cash, you get your badge. And, uh, and the badge is electronic, of course, got a little chip in, and, mm -hmm. and uh, everybody tries to figure out how to program it, but they have no idea what the, what the thing does. So that's, <laughs> it's a hacker challenge, it's total inscrutable black box. And by the end of the, of the week, a lot of people figure out how to make it do something. Oh, sure. but, but they're much more hardcore than I am. Right. Um, but but um, this year, or last year, there was the beginning of what they call the biohacking village. And I actually gave a talk there uh, just on general observations of, about uh, uh, ethics and biohacking and, and how I see the, uh, the role of the artist in figuring out where we're going. But anyway, so, so biohacking, I predict, is going to follow the same trajectory as internet and computer hacking. Uh, you know, there, there's no reason why it won't. By that, I mean, people will do hacking for good, and they'll do hacking for neutral, and do hacking for bad. Just because, why wouldn't they? I mean, that's my, that's my assumption going forward. So, but you're much more an expert than I am. Well, so you should be aware that there are many people who are trying very hard to push that in benign directions. Yeah. At least not dangerous directions. Yeah. So um, I I subscribe to the DIY bio mailing list, yeah. not because I'm interested in anything they're doing, but because I want to try to make sure that they don't kill themselves right. or other people. Yeah. Um, and by and large, I think that they have not scared me yet. Yeah. Um, there's several levels for this discussion. Um, I think one of the one of the best things you can do if you are um, well, JCR Licklider. I don't know if you know that name. No, JCR Licklider was um, the first uh, DARPA director of information technology. Early 60s, maybe maybe even late 50s, um, but uh, he worked he worked at MIT when I was there, and 
Uh, he told me once that you know, when you have a dangerous technology, there's uh, two things you can do. One is you can try to keep it secret and not tell anybody about it, and you, know, you go and do your thing. And the other, as he quaintly said, was you can run like hell. <laughs> and um, you can become better at it faster than the bad guys. Yep. And uh, there's no way that we're going to keep biotechnology right. secret. That leaves option two. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so there's strong motivation to become better at it rapidly to uh, put in place the uh, infrastructure that will actually let us do things so well that we are able to protect ourselves even against the engineered threats. Yeah. Uh, that's where I see things playing out. Yeah. So uh, what are those threats? Uh, let, let's, let's cut to the chase here. <laughs> so uh, I, don't, I don't know how much you know about the um, the way the government is trying to regulate bioterrorism in the U.S. I know a little bit about, you know about You know about the select agent list? Yes. So the select agent list is maintained by the CDC uh, and the you know, Department of Homeland Security. It, it contains a list of on the order of 20 or so uh, bacteria that are so dangerous that, you know, that there's you know, strict controls on who can work on who can work with them, where they can be grown, uh, what you can do with the cultures, uh, how you send them back and forth between people, etc. Uh, that list has genuinely dangerous organisms on it, like smallpox and uh, you know tularemia and anthrax and a, a set of other dangerous organisms. So there's this assumption, I think, on the part of the public that you know the dangerous thing might be that somebody would take a an agent which is on that list, or maybe a, a benign agent, and engineer it to right. do something that was more dangerous. Uh, you know, a, a classic example would be uh, make take your anthrax strain and make it antibi antibiotic resistant to every known antibiotic. Right. Um, absolutely, you could go do that. And the technology for doing that is actually pretty elementary and most, at this point, most undergraduates uh, you know, in biochemistry probably would at least have a pretty good idea about how to go about doing that. They'd probably kill themselves while they were trying to do it. You yeah. know, that's a that's that's another issue. But but the honest fact of the matter is that you don't have to do that in order to do something that's dangerous. Right. So I don't have to go find some laboratory that has uh, you know has anthrax uh, in its freezer and go break in. That's not how you would go get anthrax. The way you get anthrax is you get on a plane and you go to Waco, Texas, and you find a cattle feed lot and you culture some soil. Right. And the anthrax is there. Yeah. And uh, so I think there's a lot of misplaced concern about how we prevent, you know, what I think of as being the rather unlikely right engineering of these pathogens in comparison to the relatively easy ways of getting a hold of some of these pathogens. Right. Having said that, you know, there's you know, one pathogen which is not on the select agent list, which I think is a, has, we have every reason to be concerned about, and that's influenza. Mm -hmm. And Influenza, uh, you probably are familiar with the 1919 flu, yeah. flu pandemic. Uh, killed some of my family back, back in the day. Uh, there's really no, 
is just some things about influenza that make it especially dangerous. It's um, easily transmissible uh, by aerosol, uh, highly contagious, uh, doesn't require you know personal contact. Uh, so there's there's many aspects of the uh, you know sort of uh, infection process of influenza that are very scary. Right. Uh, the thing that for many years the thing that gave me some confidence that we were not in trouble was that I thought that there was a uh, significant technical difficulty in engineering influenza strains. It turns out that over the past four or five years, uh, all of that technical difficulty has disappeared. Right. <laughs> so, hooray. <laughs> hooray. Uh, so, I think there's a real... You know, that, that probably is, is the single uh, you know, agent that concerns me the most right. Uh, right at the moment, is an engineered influenza. Um, I think there's uh, little doubt that the technology would allow you to go do that pretty easily. Uh, I think if you did it in a careful way, you could probably immunize your own population yeah. ahead of time. So that's the one that keeps me up at night. Right. Uh, no, I think there's very little, very little that can be done to protect against that, except for, as I said before, the run like hell approach. Right. And what does that mean? That means that we have to stop thinking about bio, biology and bioengineering as a gentlemanly scientific pursuit mm -hmm. where you know where you you go into the lab and you know then at the end of the day you come out and go and have drinks and uh, you know you celebrate the uh, you know the fact that uh, you've, you've you know, just done some marvelous experiment right and turn it into a, uh, a factory mm -hmm. uh, a, an engineering discipline where things happen on a schedule, where they're predictable, yep. where you know you have the resources to just go do it. Yep. So I remember a time, for example, you may remember the uh, uh, the SARS uh, epidemic. I don't know if you oh, right, it right, an yeah. epidemic. The SARS infection. I process. think we were talking about SARS in Russia at first. <laughs> it's always my little no. hiccup that I remember it. it, it uh, I can't remember what it stands for. But yeah. yeah. So there's recent memory. And MERS. Yeah, MERS. Mid Middle East Respiratory yeah. Syndrome. Yeah. That came out, I'm thinking, like 2004, somewhere, somewhere in that yeah. range. And, you know, the news reports had many reports about that. At the time, I you know sort of was learning biology, I knew enough to be dangerous, uh, as it were. <laughs> and um, he said, "Okay, it's a uh, you know, news reports came out. It's a uh, it's a coronavirus. All right. Uh, I don't know anything about coronaviruses, but sure, I'm interested. I want to know more. Let's go find the sequence of this." MERS yeah. virus. No sequence. Yeah. Time passes. Two weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks in, some Canadian group finally sequences the organism yeah. and puts the information in the, in the public databases. Three weeks. Yeah. You know, there's no excuse for that. Right. Right. No reason. It should have been on day one right. that you sequenced that thing. Yeah. And so there's, there's just a sort of a cultural disconnect right. 
between the gentlemanly pace with which medicine and biology has progressed historically and where we need to be in terms of actually making something happen. Well, when I first heard your name uh, from uh, Henry Minsky back when, he said, uh, Tom Knight's a computer scientist who wants to make biology engineering. Yes. And, and, uh, and that was kind of intriguing to me. Um, I'm not a scientist myself, and uh, everything I know about computer science, I learned on the job. Um, <laughs> but I'm married to a molecular That's, biologist. That, that, of course, is how all of us right, learn. Right, right. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have any academic you know, time-wasting stuff beforehand. It was right. just right into the deep end. But, but, um, but I confess, when I first heard that, I was intrigued because I didn't know what, what that meant. And then I, you know, I heard about iGEM, and I looked into that. And, uh, and I thought, you, you were onto something. But I, I got to admit, it took me a while for me to just get your basic ideas. I didn't, I didn't understand the, the point you were making. And now I, I think I'm actually the, you can look around and see what you're talking about. Right. right. Um, so, so what has to happen is, you know, after you've sequenced this organism, after you've got it to that place, I mean, that, that's, a, that's just a given these days. You ought to be able to do that very rapidly. Then you have to figure out, how am I going to protect people from this? How do, how do I understand what's happening? So there's an analysis piece there, which is, says, you know, oh, uh, I now have the sequence for this organism. You know, what, what does it do? Right. So there's an analytic piece of, you know, and we're, we are way away from the place where you could take, say, the sequence of a new influenza strain and predict how dangerous it was. Right. We, you know, we're, you know, we're decades away from that, I think, maybe more. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of work that just has to go there. Then we're probably actually closer to the next thing you have to do, which is to do something about it, make something that's going to protect people for it. Right. And uh, I think there's there's genuine hope that we could you know turn that around, and that's going to take you know a, uh, a you know concerted effort to put in place the rapid uh, development of antibodies. For those viruses, the uh, the synthetic capability to you know make make the uh, DNA that's going to code for those antibodies and uh, push it out the door and scale up so right. that you know it isn't enough to have one dose that's going to protect one person. Um, if we really have a pandemic, then you know we're going to need industrial industrial scale yes. production yeah. capacity for yeah. these things. And uh, you know we're uh, we're trying very hard, and I think the government is also beginning to realize that they need those kinds of facilities. Right. But you know this this can't happen over uh, you know at, at, a, at a you know six months time frame. Right. This has to happen over a couple of week time frame. Right. And well, let's talk for a second when you said the government. Well, because we now see with our current administration. A, a um, meat cleaver being taken to, in my opinion, I'm editorializing here, yeah, right? I think that's, um, that's a accurate. meat cleaver being taken not only to research budgets, um, but also to the very idea of science. The idea, you can, and, and it, it starts in, in uh, to me, it, it, there's echoes of. of you know, Hannah Arendt and the origins of totalitarianism, the origins of fascism, where you, to, for your political goals, for your goals of, of, of power, you, you uh, first attack the idea that there is such a thing as truth. Right? Orwell talked about this, and Arendt uh, talked about it, what Hitler did, and you attack the notion that there's such a thing as truth that can be objectively uh, determined. And so this... Um, you know, in, in 1984, you, you get the person to believe that 2 plus 2 is 5 today, and tomorrow they'll believe 2 plus 2 is 3, and they're entirely comfortable with that because that's what they've been conditioned to because their their life basically deter, depends on them being able to, to act that way. So, but that 
of course, uh, rules out the possibility of science. Because you can't have science if 2 plus 2 equals 5 one day, 2 plus 2 equals 3 the next day. So um, how is government to fulfill its role in, in producing a defense against influenza, whether engineered or, or naturally occurring, if, if the idea of science is under assault? Well, I think it's a very dangerous situation we find ourselves in. Um, I think you've, I think, I think you've identified uh, a um, you've identified you know a, a set of problems that, in terms of uh, government funding, uh, the good news is that uh, I think the uh, the private sector and the commercial sector. Has to make money, yeah. <laughs> and the way you make money is by doing things, making things, and doing things that people want. And uh, the only way you can do that is right. if you do things that obey natural law. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the government can decide to to you know uh, you know close the ears and, and say la 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 as much as it wants, uh, the private sector is going to continue to research and to you know, rely heavily on science. Uh, is it damaged by the government not doing things? Absolutely. Uh, but I don't, I don't think you're going to shut down science because the government stops, do, stops believing in it or stops doing it. Uh, the results of science and engineering are too valuable. They're too valuable to the government. Right. I mean, think about the you know whole industrial, uh, you know, the military industrial complex. Right. I, I assure you that Boeing and Lockheed and Northrop are not going to shut down their R and D efforts just because you know right. the government says uh, they don't believe in climate change. Right. How concerned are you about the climate situation? Well, I have to say that I don't really know very much about it. Uh, so any opinion I you know, give you is going to be one not really grounded on analyzing the data myself. Yeah. Uh, I have to assume, I think, that the people who are carefully looking at that data uh, have made good judgments. And so... I, I believe them, yeah. uh, but you know it's not because yeah, you're I've gone and I'm I'm relying on anecdotes from the scientific community. I choose to believe them, yeah. uh, you know. So uh, perhaps I'm as bad as some of the <laughs> some of the people who well, are denying. We can all be experts in everything. <laughs> That's right. right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I I don't claim to have a, have a privileged position. In terms of understanding what's happening, uh, you know, I certainly, uh, perhaps more than your typical, uh, you know, citizen, I, I certainly do understand, you know, some of the science and the, what the numbers mean, you know, when we see you know huge increases in CO two concentrations and so forth. Uh, those are certainly indicative that there's something important happening. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm an amateur. Yeah. My friend, Tom Athanasu, who I interviewed uh, on Skype, I need to get his uh, interview up on the YouTube soon. Um, Tom left a job in Silicon Valley. He'd been a technical writer for a few decades in the mid-1990s to devote the rest of his life and career to um, the climate issue. So he wrote a book on global warming in 19... 92, I think. So he was pretty far ahead of it. But, yeah. but um, and he started a think tank. So he's got like a two person think tank that consults to international agencies uh, on what to do about the climate situation. And Tom says that, um, first of all, he, he know, understands the science, you know, of, of where, where we are. And he said that, but still, Given where we are today, there's still time to solve the problem. There, there are technical solutions, but oh, there are right. but there are not 
So the problem is not that there are a lack of technical solution. The problem is a lack of political solution. Oh, right. And <laughs> and and um, according to Tom, and I agree with him. I don't say agree. His his, odd, his argument makes logical sense to me. You can't have a political solution to the climate problem without a political solution to the social justice problem, because the the we need the cooperation of basically every human person on earth. And if somebody is getting by on a dollar a day and doesn't have a job and lives in a slum, he could care less about the problems of somebody in suburbia who's got three cars in the garage and two vacation homes. And, they, and they're crybabying because their life is going to be impacted. The guy, you know, <laughs> right. he, he's, well, that's your problem. Too, too bad. You that's know? Right. And, and uh, so... If we're going to elicit the, the cooperation of everybody, we need to make, give, make sure as far as we can that everybody gets a fair shake. Sure. And and uh, so that's the challenge. And, uh, you know, we have a finite amount of time before that window closes. So how do we go about getting everybody? And that's, anyway, that's, that's a problem. I don't have a solution to that. But I think that that is a big part of the situation in the world today. Well, there may be things that could be done that wouldn't involve convincing every person on earth that they have to do something individually. Yeah. So you know, I think the, the rise of renewable energy sources uh, sounds very positive. Yeah. Uh, the recent developments in solar cells uh, yeah. and the improvements that we've seen there are dramatic and impressive. Uh, wind power looks like it's coming on yeah. you know, fairly rapidly. Well, I don't know. How do, how do the people in Martha said you think about <laughs> <Well>, it? <laughs> it's a, a more not in my backyard uh, place. You know, it'd be hard to imagine. Mm -hmm. You know, we want wind power as long as we can't see the turbines, right? Um, or hear them. Yeah, or hear them. Um, although it, it's a little bit more complex than that, but. Uh, the, the shallow water wind turbine project, which was under development for 15 years or so, uh, has been finally scuttled um, after going through an enormous set of regulatory hurdles. And the opponents, many of whom are my friends, uh, or at least people I'm friendly with, uh, said it wasn't merely a matter of not in my backyard, we don't want those shallow water uh, turbines because they're ecologically not, but, but also because the back of this project are shady and there's a lot of, of sleight of hand and a lot of, of dishonesty. And that I think turned out to be the case, <laughs> you know? So, so it wasn't merely, I don't want them putting turbines up where I go fishing now or go sailing. I don't want to look at them when I look over towards Cape Cod. Although there was a fair amount of that, um, but it was also I don't trust them. Um, so anyway, um, and now there's more uh, uh, projects under development for bigger uh, turbines in deeper water, and there's much less opposition to that. So, but it was interesting to watch trying to figure mm -hmm. out who was on which side. And when we first started Ginkgo Bioworks, we uh, we actually went around looking for uh, you know, applications of biology. And one of the first ones that came up was the idea of perhaps uh, solving some environmental problems, and, and, you know, in the, specifically in the oil industry. And we spent probably six months, nine months, talking to the people uh, in the uh, Athabasca oil sands region. Okay. And proposed a number of different ways in which we could enhance the you know, output of, uh, of oil, uh, um, help in the breakdown of some of the toxic products, uh, do some environmental cleanup of the, the rivers, which are just amazingly bad up there. Um, and at the, end of, at the end of that period, we basically gave up, uh, not because we thought we couldn't do it, but because 
it was very clear that they just don't care. Yeah. <laughs> really deeply, at the end of the day, they just don't care. Yeah. So there, there was no, was no real opportunity to do something good there. Yeah. Uh, That's really depressing. It is. It doesn't surprise me though. No. Uh, and um, so the good news is that uh, I think they're going to go broke because of fracking and you know some of the other technologies that are coming on board. Yeah. So we'll at least get rid of some of the really, really bad things that are yeah. happening. Um, yeah, yeah, Tony Horwitz is a writer, uh, lives on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, he's a, part of a literary power couple. His, his wife is Geraldine Brooks, and they both won Pulitzers, she for fiction and he for reporting. But uh, he's an adventurer. They, they met as war correspondents, so they both had this adventurous streak. Um, much settled down now with their parents. But, but anyway, so Tony did this, this project about two years ago where he wanted to trace the route of the XL pipeline. So he got himself a pickup truck and he drove up to the tar sands. And at some point when he gave a talk at the library about it, he said, whether you say oil sands or tar sands immediately tells you what, how you come down on it. I right? see. And, uh, and, uh, and he followed, he went, it went up into the tar sands and he drove around in the, the fields, and then he followed the route down through Canada, through uh, the Dakotas, into Iowa, and he met with proponents and opponents and everything in between. But, um, you know, he, he said a lot of, he said that the, the issue was complex, but he also said there were a lot of people that, he, the corporate towers that really just didn't care. They, no, you, yeah. you could, and he talked about, it, I just had this image of, you know, how big the trucks are. Like they're as big as that ship across the way there. Oh, and, that's right. And, and uh, um, so he had this little Toyota pickup truck, <laughs> and they could have squashed him and not even noticed, right? And he was driving illegally because he was he tried to get permission to, to go on to drive around, and they wouldn't give to him when they found out he was a journalist. So he, being the kind of guy he is, he just went in the back way and drove around. And he put this big stick he said, with a flag on the top in the hopes that they wouldn't they wouldn't run him over and squash him. him. But anyway, so his, his book is called Boom, which uh, which I recommend. It's, it's available as an ebook. It's a short read, but it's really it's really informative. And it's really funny. You might relate to it, having given your experiences. Well, well, I've never been up there, but you don't need to go up there to see the disaster that's happening. All you right. need to do is open Google Earth and take a look at the pictures. Yeah. Uh, the thing, one of the things that's most amazing about that particular region is that the uh, the oil uh, slash tar sands have a huge amount of sulfur, yeah. you know, which, which has to be removed before, well, before anything can really get done with it. Yeah. Uh, you know, they uh, they actually remove it even before they put it into the into the pipes. And uh, the question then is, what do you do with the sulfur? Right. There's only so many matches you can make. Right? Yeah, and so. Uh, so there are these mountain-sized piles of elemental sulfur uh, next to the mines. And you know, I don't know how your high school chemistry is, but you have two choices of what you could do with that sulfur. You could oxidize it, in yeah. which case you get sulfuric acid. Right. Or you can reduce it, in which case you get hydrogen sulfide. Right. And Many people might not realize how bad hydrogen sulfide is, but it's horribly poisonous. Hey, I'm a firefighter. Oh, well, yeah, there you yeah, go. So. so you know. Yeah. And um, so basically you're stuck. Yeah. You know, this elemental sulfur is just there. Yeah. Um, you could react. To, if you had lime, you could make gypsum out of it, but you don't. Have lime. Take all the lime from Indiana, truck it up to Canada. Yeah, they're not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. uh, this little little aside here. So it, it, uh, I'm a volunteer firefighter, so I take all kinds of, of training. And of course, uh, a big concern for firefighters now, and the, the modern firefighters, cancer. Right. So sure. the, the, the big danger to firefighters is not getting burned up in a building or a building collapsing on you. That's that's not what firefighters die from. They die from cancer. And heart attacks, car crashes, but but um, 
So, and my chief is very emphatic about it. He's a new, modern, the old guys wore sooty, sooty gear, it was a badge of your macho, sure. you know, history. And and, uh, and our chief is like at every fire scene, everybody gets hosed off you before you can go back to the station. If you get any soot on you at all, you're out of commission while your gear gets washed, you know, it's decon. But anyway, so, and we have courses on, on combustion products. And so the term for combustion products to watch out for is what we call MEBS, which stands for methyl ethyl bad shit. <laughs> you, would, you would appreciate that. So this, anytime there's a, 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 a structure fire, any kind of fire, there's going to be MEBS there. Yeah, so well, put your gear on, breathe air, don't be a macho guy, breathe it, you know. Breathing in the smoke, but anyway, that's 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 a side. We, so we have lots of that. In the yeah, lab. yeah. <laughs> um, so I don't want to take up your whole day here, but but uh, but a subject that, that is. Well, we want to leave time for a tour. So. Yeah, I want to see. I absolutely want a tour, and, yeah. and uh, um, but I want to switch gears to to a little bit. So what I'm trying to do, as because I, I believe in civilization, I believe in, in art, and I believe in, in the, the value. We can relate to those. Yes, yeah, and, I, and I, I really do believe that that that, um, that all our existing art forms, uh, for example, fiction, movies, uh, uh, painting, drama, video games. Uh, all these things have a role to play in helping people come to terms with where we are now and what the challenges are that, that face us. And then we need new art forms. We need virtual reality as a new technology. How we're going to use that to create new art forms that will create empathy and understanding. Because, um, because I, I just when I look at, at uh, ISIS or any of these anti-civilization forces that are out to blow up history and, and, and force, uh, you know, denying that two plus two equals four and all that. Anyway, so do you have anything to say on that general subject of civilization and where it comes from and how to preserve it? And, uh, <laughs> well, deep thoughts. Um, I certainly agree that art, you know, plays a, you know, plays a, an oversized role Obviously, you, you know that most of the scientific community has also, uh, you know, has a, has a great deal of respect for the artistic world. Uh, we here at Ginkgo actually have a, uh, a person who's uh, sort of an ambassador to the more creative end of things, uh, Christina Agapakis. Uh, she would be very happy to talk to you about that. Okay. But uh, she... She has uh, been, you know, trying very hard to bring in uh, people that think about uh, art and design as part of the uh, bioengineering community. So she does outreach, uh, talks to chefs. Mm -hmm. So we we have uh, have chefs that come in and uh, do custom fermentation. Yes. with some of the strains that we're we're building yeah. we have uh, uh, she's very connected with the community that is uh, looking at some of the biologically manufactured uh, textiles and building products <clears throat> there's a there's a group uh, in New York City now that is uh, making uh, Making furniture and uh, building blocks for houses out of uh, out of cultured ingredients, which mostly are paper, that get infected with uh, mold mycelium, specific strain of mold, which uh, grows into the into the uh, into the uh, culture medium in the shape of a of a container. And then, be, then you know, when when it uh, stops growing, and uh, you know, it basically turns into something that is sort of like styrofoam, except stiffer and more structural. 
Wow. So you can you can actually build things out of it. You can build. Well, they, for, you we can we build, have mold in Martha's Vineyard. Right. <laughs> you can, but, but this kind of mold lets you build things like pieces of furniture yeah. out of out of things that once were alive. Yeah. So instead of having to you know cut down trees and make make something by cutting up pieces the right shape, you can actually engineer engineer the them and, and grow them in the correct shape. Yeah. So. Uh, she's she's very inspired by that. We're you know looking at uh, we have a program with the uh, Harvard Herbarium. Uh, they have collections of uh, of flowers, as you probably can guess. Yeah. But what's interesting is they have collections of flowers that are now extinct. Wow. And so. Uh, we have a project with them where we go in, we take samples of those extinct flowers, we sequence the DNA uh, from those flowers, we extract the, uh, the sequences of the genes that encode for uh, you know, scent producing molecules, synthesize those uh, you know, pieces of DNA and express them in yeast. Wow. So, so how, how do you know which genes uh, code for scent? Well, you don't necessarily know that you've got all of them, but you you know there's you know in general the class of of proteins that uh, that we look for are uh, proteins called terpene synthetases. Yeah. Uh, so terpenes are a class are one of the major classes of scent producing molecules. Okay. And there's specific uh, proteins that take the uh, main metabolic intermediates of, uh, of an organism like yeast, and uh, the action of this enzyme converts those main metabolic intermediates uh, into a, a scented product. So uh, we're probably never going to get it right yep. in terms of producing something that is exactly the scent that this right. flower once made. You know, there's, I think there's a, a bit of artistic uh, mystery associated yeah. with doing something like that. That you know, I think in the case of Christina, she really, uh, you know, appreciates, and I think all of us do. Well, can we it's, bring back these plants? I know George Church wants to bring back the woolly mammoth by grafting mammoth genes on the Asian elephant uh, backbone, yeah, and, 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 he, and he wants women that are going to bear Neanderthals. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I know. Yeah, and bring back the heath hen. But these are mammals where you you can take a chicken. If we get, what can we do to bring back plants that have gone extinct? Can you graft uh, these genes onto an existing plant? Or a, a well, I, I I should say uh, I am very skeptical okay. about you know George's plants. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, it makes it makes great press. Yeah, and you know I I applaud him for his ability to inspire. Yeah. Uh, you know, the public with ideas like that, but yeah. uh, you know this this doesn't even fall in the ten year category. I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, All right. I think it's uh, you know we're we're you know and for many reasons. I mean the uh, you know the the sequences that that come out of these is, are probably not very good. Yeah. Uh, but the sequence of the DNA is the least of the problems. I mean, right. You've got lots and lots and lots of other things, very complicated things going on in a, in a mammalian egg. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. You'll believe it when you see it. I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> but but uh, I'll tell, tell, tell me about engineering bacteria. Tell, yeah. tell me about the 30% the 30 of the genes in, right. in, in a mycoplasma that we have no idea what do. Right. Uh, you know, let's start there. Yeah, I, I did read Venter's book, by the way, where he explained that that uh, very that project very clearly because I, right. I I didn't understand until I read his book why you would go about doing you know engineering the the basic minimal cell. Well, and uh, very important, yeah. and and mostly it's important not for what has been done, but for what comes next. Right, and you know, I, you know. This is a very important point and is sort of a hobby, uh, a hobby horse of mine. Um, the thing that's missing in biology right now is predictive modeling. Right. We, uh, 
It's like writing computer programs where you don't have a debugger. Uh, you only, I mean, I, I programmed in that mode for many years where, you know, you, uh, you submitted uh, a card deck and yeah. overnight it ran and uh, you'd get a, if you were lucky, you got a core dump at the end of that and you've got to paw over to figure out what happened. Um, we are sort of in that category right now for biology. Yeah. The only way you can know whether something is going to work is by trying it. Right. Imagine what, how little we could do in electronics if that were the case. Right. So I don't think people understand the power of good simulation. For a, a modern microprocessor like the one in this laptop in front of me, uh, you know, there's you know, several billion transistors in that chip. Yeah. Uh, there is no single person on earth who understands what all of those transistors do. Uh, only a collective group of people. And the only way you could ever get that system to function is not by building, you know, a million different versions of it, you know, each time fixing one of the problems. The only way you could do that is by simulating it and fixing the problems, not by building it, but by uh, realizing that, you know, the simulations didn't work. Right. And we're in a very primitive state with respect to biology right now. We have no good simulation tools. And uh, that means that there is no substitute for doing those thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of experiments in order to get something working. Right. Uh, that has to change. Uh, absolutely has to change. And the only way that, that we're going to make that, you know, to be able to go from where we are to that level of understanding is by, uh, you know, building good models. When you're trying to build a good model, you don't start with, uh, you know, the human brain and, uh, you know, and, right. and trying to simulate that because we have no hope of understanding that anytime soon. You start with the simplest thing that you can find. Right. And the simplest things you can find are, uh, the, you know, these very simple bacteria like the mycoplasmas. So, um, the irony is after... Uh, after the great experiments that JCVI has done and the, um, and the terrific engineering that came about as a result of that, they actually are not doing, you know, I, ironically not, not doing the next step of trying to really build those models. Yeah. That's happening partly at Stanford, but actually more of it is happening at, uh, you know, in Barcelona. Uh, there's a group, uh, Luis Serrano's group uh, in Barcelona. We, we talk about uh, that. the elucidation of just fundamental simulation stuff. I, I, I've gone to the, there's a conference that has happened uh, three years running now in Boston called the CRISPR Congress. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I've gone to all three of them. And it's interesting to see that the, the, the first year it was all kinds of different directions. And, and, uh, and a lot of it was just trying to understand how the stuff even works in nature. And, and there were already companies springing up to apply CRISPR technology to, to, to real world problems. And there were talks on possible therapeutic uses in humans to fix diseases. But it was really just kind of like a the wild west. It was kind of chaotic. And this year, a mere two years later, there were, uh, there were two very distinct threads in my perception. And one was elucidating the basic science. So uh, what are the ways we can characterize how it works? What are the ways we can, uh, uh, different classes of assays, what are their strengths and weaknesses, different, you know. Um, and there was, and, and then that, that's one thread. The other thread was, was therapeutic uses. And it was fascinating because they actually are therapeutic uses for certain Small classes, case, very specific case. Because a fellow from MIT, uh, I forget his name now, uh, 
starts with A. Anderson or something, maybe. He's a biochemist, and he talked about delivering uh, CRISPR into liver cells, um, and, it, and it's actually cured a disease in mice. And but the, as he said, in case it, the question was, how do you get CRISPR where you want it to? Just the cells you want to get it to, and so. He wanted to go to the liver, so he encased it in lipids because the liver processes sure. lipids. He said it's like giving him a butterball. But if you want to get it to the heart or to you know the foot, there is no such you know easy easy route. Mm -hmm. But but anyway, one of the, the the talks this year was by a woman whose name I've forgotten from Caribou Biosciences, and uh, she was reporting on like hundreds of experiments. Uh, maybe even more than that, looking at uh, what happens when you use CRISPR to cut DNA, depending on the size of the molecule, the size of the guide you're using, whether you're reading it this way or whether you're reading it that way, what the DNA sequence is on the, on the target, what the DNA sequence is on the thing you're sticking in there. And it was kind of like listening to somebody read a phone book. <laughs> you know, but but I, I sat there and realized that it was boring, but it was fascinating because it was like she was building, in essence, the periodic table of the elements for CRISPR. Well, you know, so there, there, I think you see very clearly the difference between sort of the scientific world and the engineering world. You know, the scientists, you know, scientists now know about CRISPR. <laughs> they know enough to write the chapter in the book about it. Yeah. The engineers, yeah. Uh, that's a different matter. Right. They've got to go and use that. Yeah. They've got to, you know, understand all of the naughty bits, yeah. all the things that don't quite work the way they're supposed to. Right. And so there you saw a, a, a paper which was intended to tell you all of the, all of the gotchas, yeah. all of the things that you thought were going to work because you thought you understood what was happening but are not really. And, you know, biology is chock-a-block full of those. Right. And so I think, I think we, uh, I started out saying some of these things early on. Uh, you know, there's a, uh, there's this assumption that we understand enough about biology to go do it. Yeah. And by and large, I think that's not right. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, we have, we have large areas of ignorance that are uh, surrounded by, you know, just so stories yeah. about how it's supposed to work. Yeah. And uh, the large areas of ignorance have to be filled in. Yeah. Well, maybe we should wrap up there and go for okay. our... Okay. That, that's, uh, that'll be... <laughs> we'll give, we'll just assume this turned off now.